right, so last time in my effort to not make this look like a hostage video, I put in a background uh, that made my computer too hot, and so there was terrible noise in the background the whole time. I am sorry about that. Um, so now, I hope that this works a little better. Uh, so welcome to lecture 1.2. This is our overview of topics for the course. So, um, the four topics we'll be looking at in this course are as follows individual responsibility for climate change, the rationality of voting, racism in the individual and society, and online public shaming. So let's just look at each of these topics briefly so that you have a sense of what to expect in this course, and then we'll be underway. All right, so the first topic we'll be covering, uh, starting on day two actually, is climate change. So here is the basic question we'll be interested in. Each of us, as an individual, makes a negligible contribution to climate change. And then the question is, does this mean that we are not responsible as individuals for climate change? So we're going to look at three philosophers that have something to say about this. The first is Walter Sinnott Armstrong, and the main conclusion he's going to draw is that it's actually surprisingly difficult to show that we as individuals have obligations to mitigate climate change. We'll then look at a piece by a philosopher named Melanie Banks, who's going to argue that Sinnott Armstrong is completely wrong, um, and that we need a different kind of model to understand responsibility for climate change than Sinnott Armstrong thinks we do. So Banks is going to say climate change is the result of a collective action, but we as individuals are responsible for the collective actions that cause climate change. And then our last reading for this unit is by a philosopher called Julia Nevsky. And although she's not talking about climate change in particular, what she says is extremely relevant to how we th should think about collective action problems in general. And she's going to have this kind of counterintuitive thesis that you can help without making a difference. And she thinks that once we understand the difference between helping and making a difference, where she's going to spell out what these two things involve, then we'll see that um, a lot of our thinking about collective action problems is mistaken and that um, we can kind of get through the types of issues that uh, trip us up normally. So uh, this paper is actually going to be about reasons rather than responsibility. So she's going to say that when you can help, you have a reason to act, even if you can't make a difference. Um, but uh, the implications for the issues that we'll be talking about in this course, which do involve obligations, will, I think, be fairly clear. Uh, okay, unit two, the rationality of voting. So here's the puzzle. An individual's vote is highly unlikely to determine the outcome of any election. The question thus arises, does this mean that none of us ever have a reason to vote? So we will be looking at two papers in this unit. The first is by Alexander Guerrero, and he's going to say that the reason we should vote is to increase our preferred candidate's manifest normative mandate. Uh, we'll get into what he means here in the future. Uh, don't worry if you have no idea what that means right now. The second paper is by Lisa Hill, and she's going to talk about not so much um, whether or not you have a reason to vote given the kind of system that we have, for example, in the US, but she's going to say that um, we should look at, in particular, Australia, which has a system of compulsory voting, and that looking at this Australian case of a voting setup can help us to see that a system in which voting is compulsory actually makes voting more rational for individuals. And this isn't just because of the penalties imposed for not voting, according to Hill. The whole system uh, results in one where voting is more rational for individuals. All right, that's the brief overview of the rationality of voting. Uh, issue four is racism in the individual and society. So here we're going to ask some very basic questions, really. What is racism? And in particular, is racism something that is in the heads and hearts of individuals? Is it something that is in society independently of what's in the heads and hearts of individuals? Is it both? So we'll be looking at one paper by Lawrence Bloom, 
which distinguishes between what he wants to call racism, properly speaking, and other kinds of racial ills. And he see, thinks that when we distinguish between these different kinds of racial ills, we are in a better position to understand what is distinctively wrong about individual racism. We're then going to look at a paper by Tommy Shelby, which challenges Bloom and says that an account of what's wrong with, about racism needs to start with an account of racism in society. So he thinks that Bloom is mistaken in thinking that race, racism is primarily a problem of personal morality. Okay, and the final unit is online public shaming. You might think this is a little bit strange. I think this is um, a topic that has really only become even uh, relevant in probably the last 10 years or so. Um, there didn't used to be such a thing as online public shaming in the way in which we have it today. Uh, so here's the question, it's very simple. Is it okay to participate in online public shaming? Uh, so our first reading is by Catherine Norlock. She's gonna offer a view uh, that explains why participating in online shaming is especially morally risky. So she thinks there's something especially morally risky about shaming others online. She's gonna pr try to explain exactly what that is. Um, and then a paper by Bellingham and Parr is also going to say that online public shaming is morally risky, but they're going to give a specific account that explains why the benefits of online public shaming are normally outweighed by the costs. Um, and in this unit, as with all of the units we'll be studying in this course, um, you don't necessarily need to agree with what the authors we read say. So you may think that they're wrong. You may think that online public shaming is more often good than bad, for example. And the challenge then, uh, if you agree or disagree, is to have an argument that explains why. So if you disagree, why exactly uh, is the argument in the papers we read wrong, for example? All right, this was a very short video, um, just giving an overview of the four main units in this course, and uh, we'll call it quits. I will see you for lecture 1.3, which will be a primer on arguments. So what is a good argument? What is a bad argument?